Right. We are down to the wire here in Hebrews. We have today and next Sunday will be our last message in there. And you can pray for me because I have no idea where to go after Hebrews. Uh, so praying about what God wants us to study next. But let's take a look. I want to talk today about Christ and culture, what it means for us. I mean, many people think that religion is somehow private, something secret between themselves and God, something that has little to do with how you live in the everyday world. Now, I'll grant you, considering the way people fight over religion, that might be a safe approach. But listen to me, Christian. You are not given that option. Please do not be embarrassed. I am the noisiest kid in church. Your religion is not yours. You didn't make it up. You don't own it. Matter of fact, God doesn't even worry about what your point of view might be. And he certainly isn't interested in humoring your point of view. As Christians, you have to remember, we've surrendered our lives to Jesus. We've surrendered our will to Christ's will. We live our faith in the world, and it matters how we live our faith. So, as we come to the end of the book of Hebrews here, he has kind of a, a couple of shotgun approaches. There's this, there's this, there's this, and they're not all tied together, but they all are about how we live our life as Christians. So let's take a look. Hebrews chapter 13, we're going to begin at verse 1. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. For by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison, and those who were mistreated as if you were suffering. Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Keep your lives free from the love of money. And be content with what you have, because God has said, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So you can say with confidence, The Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can mere mortal do to me? Now you see there, he just, wham, hit on a bunch of different things. And that makes it rough for me. Do I chop this up and make it a bunch of different sermons? Or do I just do what he does and hit you with all of them? So, that's what I'm going to do. Let's, uh... Let's pray. Father, take all of this, put it together and make sense through your spirit. Teach us that we might learn better how to live for you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Boy, we got uh, hospitality and we got marriage and we got money and this is all kinds of stuff talked in there. Let's break it down. It has to do with your conduct towards others. Now, to start with, with strangers. What is your, how, do you, how do you conduct yourself with strangers? You, might, you never know. That guy you helped might be an angel in disguise. You don't know. Could happen. More to the point, you might need help someday. The golden rule applies here. How would you want to be treated if your life is falling apart and you're in need and you see a brother Christian there and they go, oh, go your way, be warmed and filled. And they don't do anything for you. And so it's a lesson for how we conduct ourselves with others. You never know. And the point is not just that you might get a blessing from it. The point is, that's the way it ought to be. If you were in trouble, you would want somebody to help you. You wouldn't go, oh, well, you know, I'm nobody, and so it doesn't matter. You don't think that way. And so it's a way of thinking about others by re realizing how I myself would want to be treated. 
So how do we conduct ourselves with strangers, but how do we conduct ourselves with our mates? The marriage bed should be honored. And in fact, when this was written in the Roman world, marriage was... It was more, especially among the upper classes, it was more of a legal arrangement for producing legitimate children. It had little to do with love or with mutual commitment to one another. The Romans had a very cynical saying. They would say, chastity is a virtue best found in others. Christianity overturned that concept in the Roman world. It changed it where love and mutual respect became the norm of what was expected in marriage. But I have to tell you that the modern world has become quite Roman. Christian, we of all people ought to be the ones upholding the honor of marriage. That doesn't mean you got to run in with a flaming sword and slice everybody's head off who disagrees with you. It means your life ought to be upholding and honoring marriage. That's what that means, and that's what he's saying here. Well, what about money? Because you have conduct with strangers, you have conduct with your mate. Well, what about how you use your money, or what you think about your money? You could call it mammon here, and it would fit really well. Because even our use of wealth is a matter of our faith. It's based on how we think and how we believe. And I mean, what he's saying here is, don't put all your hope in, oh, I've got this in my 401k, and it kills me the, the, how the media bounces back and forth on this. One day, they'll be beating us over the head with how horrible profits are. And the next day, they're beating us over the head with how much you've lost in your 401k. Would they make up their mind? This is my take on the, the daily news. The motto of the daily news is, how can we scare you today? What the author of Hebrews is saying here is, learn to be content. Don't fret about, don't put all of your hope and your love into what wealth you possess, because you might not possess it next week. The stock market might crash, it's done it before. Things might happen, you might lose your home. Oh no, that's horrible. Yeah, and that's life. What he's saying here is, you can trust God no matter what the situation is. God says he'll never leave you or forsake you. Now Jesus taught, seek first God's kingdom. Put your treasure in heaven where moths and rust don't corrupt and where thieves don't break in and steal. If everything you love is here, you got problems. Because everything here passes away. That great new electronic device you got for Christmas, it's already out of date. The new one's going to come in any day now. That car you have, woo oil changes, breakdown, problems, it, it's all going to pass away. You need to fix your hope on something that's eternal. Because the things here are wonderful, I grant you. I love them. But they all require help. They all break down. They all fade away. Trust God and not your stuff. Look at verse 7. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teaching. It is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not by eating ceremonial food, which is no benefit to those who do. We have an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacle have no right to eat. There's a lot of stuff in there, too. We had our conduct with the world, but now we're looking at our conduct in the church. With your leadership. We ought to respect those in leadership. And i got to tell you, the opposite applies too. Those in leadership ought to respect everybody else, and they ought to have the attitude of earning respect. Not just that, well, you, you have to respect me, but 
there ought to be an attitude of, I need to be a respectable person. Leaders are there to teach us, to protect the flock, to lead us in seeking God's will for the body, to lead us in saying, this is how you live by faith. Not how you feel about it, but how you do it. And we can all learn from their practical faith. I kind of get a laugh, especially right now when I read uh, verse 7 again there. He says, Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. I like this part here. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Consider the outcome of my way of life. I'm going through chemotherapy and radiation too. I'm a servant of the Lord and look what it's done for me. <laughs> but the fact is, I'm still standing here before you. God is still moving and working in my life no matter what my physical circumstances are and I think that's what he's talking about here. It is those who have no hope who look at it and go, oh I have cancer, that's it, I'm dead, I'm going, I'm, just bury me now. Those who have no hope have nothing to trust. But I have something that says, if I die from cancer, so what? I have an eternal life with Jesus Christ. That is my hope. Not that I won't feel pain or suffering in this life. And we can all learn from that. I can learn from that. What God is doing and working. Who's our example? Jesus. He's our great example of leadership. It says he's the same yesterday and today and forever. What that means, it doesn't mean that he doesn't change his methods. He's all, you know, we should be, we should be having church in a, in a, mud brick hovel with sticks up for a roof and we should all wear scratchy old robes because that's the way they did it in Jesus' day. It's not what that means. Uh, uh, Howard Hendricks once wrote, we can't improve our product, but we can work on the box. What it's saying here is, unlike pagan gods, Jesus is not capricious. He's the same person yesterday, today, and forever. You can trust him. What he says, he's not going to tomorrow go, oh, I was just kidding about that eternal life thing. He's not going to change his mind. He's not going to go, that's it? One sin too many. No more. He's not going to do that. His love for you, his care for you is unchanging. And you can put your eternal hope in him without fear of losing that. He's our perfect example of leadership. Finally, I like what he says there at the end. He says, don't be, well, don't be carried away by strange teachings. That's a good thing. But he says, it's good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not by eating ceremonial food. And what he means by that is, you do not find your reality with God in going through a couple of ceremonies. Now, whatever I say here is going to insult somebody, so I'll just be funny and do what I want to do. Just walking through that door and coming down here and looking up at the cross and doing that, that may be a ritual, that may be something you learned, that may be respect that you were taught as a child, and I don't trash it for that. But walking down that aisle and genuflecting before this cross does not bring me to God. You need to have a relationship with God. You don't just come in here and eat the Lord's Supper once a month and go, that's it. I, I had some crunchies and some juice, and I'm good with God. You better be good with God before you take the Lord's Supper, because the Lord's Supper isn't going to do anything for you. Genuflecting, if you don't have a relationship with Christ, isn't going to do anything for you. And what he's saying here is, don't assume rituals and religious symbolism are what God cares about. He cares about you. He cares about a daily living relationship with you. That's important. Verse 11. Now, up to this point, up to the first ten verses, like I said, he's been doing this shotgun thing. Bang, bang, bang. 
Now he's going to get to the point of his book here, which is, let me remind you, this is written around 70 A.D., 70 years after Christ's death. It's written when the city of Jerusalem is being besieged by the Roman army. They're not quite done yet. They're bringing in troops. They're putting up siege walls. They're building siege machines. People are still going in and out of Jerusalem in fear because the Roman army at some point is going to get everything ready. They're going to clamp down the city and they're going to attack. And the people in the city are, are having to make a decision. Let's think about this. See, it's very easy to think of them as historical people you see in a movie. But don't think of it that way. Think of it as you. You're in your house and the cops come in and start surrounding it. Come on out or we're going to come in. What do you do? Now there are some people that are going to go, all right, Ruby Ridge, let's go. <laughs> there are other people that are going to go, forget you, I'm out of here. And there are other people that are going to go, is this worth giving my life for? Is, is the reason that they're outside the house demanding that I surrender important enough to me to say, kill me first? That's too important. And that's the question going on with Jewish Christians in Jerusalem at this time. The Roman army is going to attack that city, and anyone with half a brain knows that the Roman army is going to win. But there are Jewish zealots in that city saying, it is worth giving my life to die protecting God's temple. The whole book of Hebrews has been about the fact that, Christian, Jesus Christ has replaced the temple. We don't need the sacrifices anymore. We don't need a temporary high priest. We have an eternal high priest, Jesus. We have a perfect sacrifice, Jesus. We don't need daily sacrifices anymore. And as we come to verse 11, you're going to see his point here. Let's take a look at it. The high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering. But the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Let us, said, Go to him outside. Outside the camp. Bury the disgrace, even. Here we do not have an enduring city. But we're looking for a city that is to come. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. I am so moved at how lazy I am as a Christian. When push comes to shove, do you cling to your stuff? Or do you cling to God? Jesus took the disgrace of suffering a Roman crucifixion outside the city. He took that disgrace for your sake. He chose it. He did it on purpose. Are you willing to risk looking foolish or worse for his sake. Let us follow Jesus even if it means the loss of everything precious to you in this world. Your money, your possessions, your friends, your position, those things are all temporary. Everything in this physical universe 
will cease. We look for an eternal city, not a temporary city. We look for eternal life, not temporary life. And you have to think, this is what he is saying here as he's writing this book, his letter. And he's calling to you, let us go to him. Take our stand with him. Because we are looking for something eternal, not for something temporary. Oh yeah, there'll be a great, remember the Alamo story about Jerusalem and the brave patriots that gave their lives. But it won't change anything. But I tell you this, Jesus Christ changes everything. He changed my life. He changed my heart. He changed my attitude toward people that I don't like. That's a change. And so finally, when it comes down to it here from verses 11 through 16, how we conduct ourselves is what tells people that Jesus Christ is real in our life. The old sacrificial order was passing away before their eyes. But the fact is, he's telling us here, the sacrifice that pleases God are not an animal that you're giving up here, but to give up yourself to God. What the psalmist says, uh, or the scripture says, a broken spirit and a contrite heart is the sacrifice that God wants. Psalm 22.3, I love this, tells us God who is enthroned upon the praises of his people. So God wants, he wants you. That's relationship. It's not ritual. It's not coming to a building once a week and punching your Bible in the time clock and saying, I I did what I have to, God, now you owe me, heaven. But it's a it's a relationship with God every day of your life. This is not just highfalutin rhetoric to get you charged up. This, for us Christian, is life. To go with Jesus, bearing his disgrace, no matter what the world thinks, no matter how foolish it might look, but to stand so that people, when their lives are falling apart, look at that and say, what do they have that I don't have? Let's pray. Father, we ask your grace on us as we go from this place. Help us, Lord, not to be arrogant, but help us to live the faith that you've given us. Help us, Lord, to live in such a way that the lost would see it and desire to know Jesus. We pray this thing in Jesus' name. Amen.